Hey everybody, it's Phil Strzula from Select Software Reviews. Today, I had a really interesting conversation with Tim Prune, who is the VP of Digital Product Development at Kelly about RPA and talent acquisition. This is a really interesting topic. It's sort of a next generation topic for those best in class talent acquisition organizations on the staffing recruiting side, as well as the corporate side. And I hope you enjoy. And our the fun fact that we had sort of uh, decided to start with was your American football career. Is that right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, in, re in reality, it's just like the weird <clears throat> thing from a German perspective because American football is not really uh, kind of like a big thing over here. It's a kind of like small kind of like league. You probably have a thousand people playing all over Germany. So I'm um, kind of like getting into American football is pretty, uh, pretty, pretty interesting. So, but uh, kind of like I kind of like found the team and, and liked it and uh, kind of like stuck playing American football for about 11 years, um, played in, um, in the defense, played defensive end and outside linebacker. And obviously now that I'm working for a U.S. company, a lot of my colleagues are um, always odd that I kind of like know the rules. They understand what they're doing. Like, hey, don't all Europeans only play soccer? What's wrong with you? So it's just like <laughs> the funny thing that all of a sudden you can talk about teams and you talk about colleges and then you really understand the system. So, uh, no, I kind of like loved it. I'm still every morning uh, in winter when I kind of like wake up, go downstairs, I kind of like feel it in my ankle. I kind of like <laughs> multiple tendons torn along <laughs> along the career. But uh, yeah, it was worth it. I mean, that's just like the price you, you need to pay for for playing American football. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I, yeah. American football, obviously kind of a brutal sport, mm -hmm. but um, a lot of fun. And it, it's kind of funny too. Like we're obviously over Zoom, but we, uh, I, I sort of asked you, or, or I had this fascination when we first connected like a month or so ago about around like people's height, like actual height over Zoom. And you're like, yeah, I'm actually like a really big guy, <laughs> you know, like well over, <laughs> well over two meters. Um, I think you said like six, four in, in yeah, exactly, language that exactly. I can understand. So yeah. that's a, it's a good build for American football, I would say. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, definitely, definitely help. But you're right. I mean, it's like on Zoom, you have no clue, kind of like how <laughs> how how big I am. So <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Very interesting. Right. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks for I guess like starting off with that fun fact. I know you. We actually had a really interesting conversation. You've got you know the the photo in the background, which mm -hmm. it has a lot of meaning to yourself as somebody who who served and you know the search and rescue capacity and, and still does on a volunteer basis, which is really cool. Um, so if, if folks out there connect with you on LinkedIn or whatever, I highly suggest that they ask you about those stories as well. Um, but the, the topic that I really wanted to talk about today um, is RPA in talent acquisition. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to spend the majority of our conversation focused on that. Do you mind just sort of setting the table first with your career path? Like kind of where, where have you been in your career and what do you do today on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, in reality, I kind of like joined the um, kind of like recruiting or staffing industry um, kind of like 18 years ago. And, and um, as, as so many people, I did it by, by accident. I mean, it's like when I went to college, I kind of like have a business degree. I wanted to focus on kind of like marketing and sales. And I never thought about going into kind of like talent acquisition or, or staffing. So it, kind of like as always, I mean, it's like you end up, you get a job offer, you, you end up in staffing, you start, you start recruiting. So, I mean, that's like where my where my background is, but basically over the course <clears throat> kind of like of the years, I, I pretty quickly realized that everything is very much tech centric and will be more tech centric along the way. And it's just like a funny, um, kind of like funny story. I kind of like, like to tell every time. I mean, I still have colleagues from my, from the time back in the days that I, that worked with me. And we had like in our office, we had a hard, we had hardwood floor and we had a wall full of drawers. So basically every time a customer calls, say, Hey, I need to have, this skill set need to have a candidate for, for that job, you would basically kind of like sit on your kind of like uh, on your chair, kind of like push yourself off and kind of like roll over over the floor to that part of the drawer where the paper, paper CVs for that specific skill sets uh, were. And it's just like, it's like, like that, that specific sound that <laughs> kind of like I still laugh about. But I think that the 
the point I'm trying to make here, I mean, it's like, think about that. That was not even 20 years ago when people would actually send in paper applications where today we talk about artificial intelligence. We talk about um, kind of like automated screening, video interviewing, and all the things that technology makes possible today and how technology really has transformed talent acquisition as, as we know it. Um, the important thing is still that like we need to have a conversation like you and I are d doing now right by a zoom. Um, but the difference is that I'm in Germany and you are uh, in the U S and I think that's just like a good example of how technology kind of like accelerated. And uh, as a result, just to come back to my kind of like career path, I pretty quickly realized that like th I need to focus on kind of like technology related items because I understand technology. I have a good and solid IT background. Um, and as a result, I started to engage in certain projects that were IT related and uh, eventually kind of like understood how important new tools were, started to support implementations for applicant tracking systems, CRM solutions, um, and kind of like stuck with it. And um, Kind of like after kind of like leaving my previous employer where I'd worked for 13 years, I joined um, Kelly Services, one of the biggest staffing organizations in, in the world, where kind of like today I focus on net new product development of our digital solutions. Um, obviously, a lot of time has passed since the days in the office with a hardboard, <laughs> hardwood floor. But um, I think w what we realize is that you need to have people that are kind of like dedicated to technology. You need to have people that understand the business, um, but at the same time also understand IT. So I'm sitting with the business today. I'm not uh, part of the IT organization. Um, and that's basically my role. I'm bridging the gap, I'm really understanding what the problems are that the business is facing, translating it into terms that our kind of like friends from IT can understand, but at the same time also ideate about new opportunities to leverage technology in areas where we haven't thought about it before. So um, kind of like that's what I'm, what I'm doing today, formal uh, kind of like job. Uh, nomination is uh, vice president of digital product development for for Kelly Services. Um, but again, it's all started with uh, recruiting and uh, and talking to candidates. I mean, what we do all day, what our core business is. That's awesome. I, I love the story because it just makes it so much more real right. and just sort of interesting aside. I was actually reading a magazine last night and I noticed there was an advertisement for working at the CIA mm -hmm. and Interestingly enough, they said, send your resume to this PO box. Right. <laughs> and I, for a second, I was sort of like, is this a function of them just sort of being like a, an old government organization? Probably not. Like it probably, they want to create a barrier to entry so that candidates who really want to do this job will actually, you know, print something out and mail it. And maybe there's some sort of security thing there yeah. as well, or, or other sort of more subtle reason that I'm not really grasping. but. It did make me think, wow, back in the day, you know, that's sort of how things must have gotten done. And this right. is sort of a naive millennial who can't imagine a world, you know, without <laughs> smartphones and, and the internet. But it also makes you think about the power of tools in a recruiter's job or really an organization's job. And, you know, you can think about the power of tools by thinking about the extremes of imagine that a individual human had to, you know, manually sort through files and read a bunch of stuff in order to make a short list and then call those people individually and set up times and schedule and, and you know, spend all this time with them to understand each answer, which wasn't recorded correctly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then you, you kind of fast forward to today and what we're gonna talk about and it's like, wow, that person they still have a job. No, nobody's job has gone away, but that person can be 20 times more effective and therefore their organization can be much more efficient. And also, I think what we'll probably learn today is that we're not really losing the human aspect of things with RPA. We're actually creating more space and more time to focus on those human interactions that really matter throughout the candidate journey. And from a recruiter's perspective, sort of taking away a lot of the repetitive tasks that they had to do and saying, let the robots do that stuff. And you can focus on what you probably like to do in the first place and why you got into recruiting, which is helping people to get the right jobs and grow your organization. So, or grow somebody else's organization for them. So um, I love that story. And, and I, I think it's cool that you've sort of seen the whole evolution started there. And now you're sort of at the forefront of this new stuff. 
Do, do you mind defining RPA for us, especially in a techno, in a talent acquisition um, sort of perspective? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're a very good question because there's a lot of kind of like confusion out there, um, kind of like what it's also, what it's actually all about. Because I mean, in reality, from a talent acquisition pers perspective, there are a lot of automation opportunities that TA should explore. Our RPA is just, in reality, it's just a subset. Um, robotic process, process automation is kind of like technology that mimics the behavior of a human. Um, and basically kind of like conducts repetitive manual tasks on behalf of the person. So that's basically different than, for example, kind of like cognitive automation, um, where you might have a chatbot that's also mimicking human behavior when you interact with a candidate, but that, that not necessarily performs um, kind of like repetitive kind of like data entry tasks, for, for, for example. So um, I think RPA has been has been on the radar for the last five to six years. There's a couple of big vendors out there that um, kind of like really are very successful that focus a lot on kind of like back office automation um, stuff because kind of like from an RPA perspective, it's always good to have very consistent, very streamlined processes, repetitive tasks mm -hmm. and high volume. And that's you, usually what, yep, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, can you just um, maybe give us like two or three specific use cases of, of like, the algorithm does this that a human used to do sort of thing. Yeah, so just as an example, um, kind of like when you think about high, high volume, um, kind of like repetitive tasks, so let's imagine you have um, somebody sitting in an office that receives emails from customers with orders, just making this up. And probably the customer sent a Excel spreadsheet um, as an attachment to the email. So the, uh, the worker kind of like opens Outlook, um, double clicks, opens the email, double clicks on the attachment, copies, um, sells A14 to A27, um, switches to SAP or, or PeopleSoft, um, kind of like opens another window, starts to copy and paste specific values into that window of the other application. And I think that's just like one of the things that kind of like we see uh, kind of like very, very often that there are a lot of kind of like, let's say cross technology um, tasks that are kind of like done on a manual basis. When you think about it in the talent acquisition space, I mean, you see that all, all day. Let's imagine you want to initiate a drug screen for a candidate, a background check. You want to initiate a um, uh, kind of like a reference check. These are traditional processes where kind of like somebody, uh, a recruiter probably needs to toggle between different systems um, and initiate each, each processes um, accordingly. So I'm, I'm not sure if, I hope this makes sense, but <laughs> just to uh, kind of like, uh, just to explain what the approach is there from our perspective. Yeah, it, it definitely does. And it seems like it's a nice solution where you have two solutions that maybe don't talk to one another, or there is no sort of trigger to make something happen when something else happens. Um, yeah. And there's, to, to your point on the vendor side of these things, there's obviously UiPath, one of the bigger ones out there. And there's also tools like Zapier or Zapier mm -hmm. that, you can connect two things. And so it's like, if somebody fills out this form, then send them this email in MailChimp and also add them to our applicant tracking system or something like that, right? right. And exactly. historically, a human would get the form fill and then say, okay, we got to add them to MailChimp and then we got to add them to the ATS and we got to do this other thing. And now it's just like, it just happens and those three different technologies don't have to talk to each other. This one kind of core vendor has figured out a way, whether it's through APIs or through, you know, understanding different elements of HTML on the page or whatever the case may be to kind of do that stuff. Yeah, correct, correct, correct. And I think that's kind of like one of the core drivers for, for RPA because I mean, we, and you know that, I mean, like when you talk to software vendors, everybody's talking about, how easy the kind of like integration is. We have open APIs and uh, we can connect to X number of different systems immediately. But when you look into it, it's not so easy. And an integration can take six to nine months if you wanna have some custom fields integrated that the vendor hasn't thought about before. It can take even longer. So the process itself is pretty clunky. And I think the beauty of the RPA solutions um, it's basically it's simplicity because you don't need to really kind of like connect the different IT systems. And I always explain that in a way like think about a remote service desk. Let's imagine you have a problem on your computer. Somebody is kind of like um, 
like talking to you and say, hey, let me hook myself into your computer. You accept that. And then the IT service desk can actually install a, an application on your computer. They take over your mouse. Um, they can perform any kind of tasks um, in, a, in a remote fashion. And that's basically how RPA works. It's, it's as simple as that. I mean, it's like you really define what the, uh, what the system needs to do. The robot gets uh, kind of like access to the system like a normal user would, and then the robot is performing the task. And I think that's just something that hasn't been here before, but that makes it so much more powerful and so much more flexible in comparison to just a standard API that if you want to change it, add something else, transfer more fields, um, you need to kind of like program a whole new level of, of um, API integration. And that makes it so much easier from our perspective. That's awesome. Yeah, much faster, easier to test, easier to say, oh, wait, we actually didn't think about X, Y, Z. We need to change this, exactly. right? Which is so much harder to do when you're using maybe a more traditional API architecture, especially exactly. an older API that, that's harder to integrate with. Um, and exactly. With a lot of these tools, you don't even need a programming background to right. get things up and running, which is amazing. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Do you mind just to even make it more concrete? I think people's uh, the wheels in their head are probably starting to turn about how this might work and how it might work for their organization. But do you mind just giving like a couple more examples, either on the staffing side and/or the corporate recruiting side, where you could use RPA to sort of optimize what you're doing for talent acquisition? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think one great, great example from our point of view um, and what we've tested like, as well is always onboarding. Onboarding, um, despite a lot of good solutions out there in the market, um, is still a very grueling and manual and manual task. And obviously it's not necessarily part of, it's like it's sitting on the interface between talent acquisition and, and, and corporate HR. But the, the reality is that it has a direct impact on the talent experience. And I think this is why TA should have a strong say on the overall like onboarding uh, process. And I mean, when you take a look at how organizations are functioning today, and that's not only the big fortune 500 corporate organizations, also kind of like small to mid-sized companies, when you want to onboard a worker anywhere in the world, it's not only a US topic, you usually need to perform several tasks. You need to kind of like set an account in a HRIS system. You need to make sure that person gets a security badge. You need to have uh, a parking permit obtained. So there's multiple things and usually there are multiple systems involved. And I think the onboarding thing this is one, one good example. We just implemented a solution for uh, one of our customers and the onboarding um, actually consisted of 17 individual processes um, and it consisted of, um, I think it was like 12 systems that, um, that we touched. So think about that from an overall integration perspective. Um, they had a very, very strong, well-known um, ATS <laughs> system implemented, but even there, they had a lot of limitations. So basically that's why RPA came in and was able to bridge the gap between these individual, sometimes home-built systems um, to kind of like print out uh, a, a security patch, something that's not part of the core system um, environment. Um, and that's basically where, where RPA is, is helping and has helped that specific um, customer. Just one example. Um, I think one, one other thing, and I think that's just something that we very often underestimate, especially during times of COVID, is candidate communication. Um, and um, you, you probably know that when you take a look at traditional applicant tracking systems, um, obviously you move candidates through the funnel. They might go from, I don't know, kind of like screening to interview step, whatever it is. But very, very often we don't communicate with, um, with talent. We always assume or often assume that talent is patiently waiting for us um, to make a decision and at some point in time come back to them. Um, where especially during times of COVID, um, when people are really kind of like time constrained. Um, imagine you lost your job, you need to find work like now. Um, you don't have the patience to wait a couple of days. You want to know immediately um, kind of like what's happening. What's the status of my, of my application? And I always use a cheesy example, but I mean, even in my small town in Germany where I'm living, I mean, my pizza service that I from time to time kind of like order pizza, I mean, they have a status tracker. So every time um, kind of like I, I order through the app, I know like, hey, now they're put, preparing the dough, they're putting the pepperoni on it and they're putting it in the, in the oven. So it's, it's just like everywhere else you have that very often in TA, you, you don't. And I think that's just where the automation 
um, kind of like really helps to stay in touch with candidates, probably trigger a text message. Um, once the candidate moved to the next steps, hey, great, you made it through the first round. Now your application is sitting with a hiring manager who is currently reviewing. Or, hey, congratulations, we would like you to, um, kind of like, we would like to invite you for, a, for an interview. Hey, by the way, do you want to schedule a slot um, through self scheduling? So I think that's just like a lot of, kind of like opportunities to really apply intelligent automation during the entire TA process, because in reality, and um, you, some people might not want to hear that, but I mean, in reality, from a high volume perspective, you can autom automate almost every step of the of the application and, and the um, and the assessment and screening process if you apply technology and combine it um, kind of like in an intelligent intelligent way. So I think from an experience perspective, speed is key, and that's where automation can come in as well from our point of view. That's awesome. And, and I love how earlier in the conversation, you sort of made this line in the sand between RPA and AI, mm -hmm. where, and I'm going to try to paraphrase you and, and tell me if I'm wrong, but essentially RPA is doing these like very repetitive defined tasks, whereas AI perhaps is taking a, a less structured task, maybe a conversation with a candidate and trying to use a little bit of intelligence to understand hey, we're looking for this sort of candidate and therefore here's a short list. It's, it's not if this, then that. It's right. let's look at this. Let's try to understand it using intelligence and then let's do another thing. So it's an if this, then that, but using more intelligence to inform decision-making that's obviously not going to be perfect because mm -hmm. um, no intelligence is, is perfect unless it's something that's very well defined. Is that exactly a exactly. Good framework? No. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely right framework. And I, I think you're also touching, and I'm, we're probably going to touch on it later, kind of like one more time, but you're actually kind of like, you, you explain the limitations of RPA as well. Because that's what a lot of people expect, like, hey, I'm, I'm going to implement the bot, and now the bot is, is, it can support, support my business like a human does. And that's, that's, not, that's not happening. That's not possible. You still need to have that cognitive capability of the recruiter to really kind of like read between the lines, to really understand kind of like maybe after a kind of like face-to-face -face or video interview, hey, there, is that something? Is the candidate the right person? Does the candidate fit into the culture of my, of my organization? Does the role fit into the long-term career planning of the candidate or will the candidate be gone once um, kind of like she finds another job somewhere else. I mean, these are the fine things that technology today um, kind of like can't assess. This is where you need the gut feel of the experienced recruiter to really make that call and make a recommendation to the business. I think it's as easy as that. Yeah, and I think that especially as you move further and further down the hiring funnel, it's going to be incredibly hard to replace a recruiter or hiring manager's brain with technology. Exactly at least in the foreseeable future. And, right. and when it does happen, we'll all be, you know, living on Mars or something. So <laughs> Probably, yeah. it'll be a different world. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, before I forget, what are some of the vendors? Like if people are, are intrigued about looking into RPA, like what are some of the companies that they should be looking at to partner with? Yeah, I mean, in, in reality, I mean, there, there's a couple of big vendors. Um, you already talked about Blue Prism, um, UiPath, um, kind of like one of our partners. I, I can disclose that, Automation Anywhere. I mean, they're, they're the big companies that are kind of publicly traded that have a couple of thousand employees. I think that's just like one, one option to look at. But uh, what I realize is that, that a lot of kind of like organizations are, are a bit afraid to really engage with the big vendors because they think like, hey, if you're not... GE or J&J, &J, you're probably going to be too small to kind of like, uh, um, make that, that happen. And probably the investment is too high. And obviously there can be a big investment if you want to automate a lot of things. But my, my recommendation is always to kind of like start the journey by looking at tools you have access to and that are not too overly costly just to start the journey. And I mean, you, you talk like Zapier. I mean, the question is, is that something that a corporate organization wants to, wants, wants to use? But Kind of like the thing I, I use a lot right now is the tool from, from Microsoft. I mean, Microsoft is, is putting a lot of, uh, kind of like focus on automation. You have um, kind of like power apps. You have um, a tool called Microsoft Power Automate. 
where you can actually also use different, like if you're using Office 365, a lot of the automation tasks we talked about, um, connecting, I don't know, Excel with Outlook or SharePoint, you can do through the built-in kind of like automation functionalities and in individual users licenses, like, I don't know, it's like $40 a month. So from a business perspective, it's not a lot of money. And my recommendation is always to kind of like start it there, test it there before you engage a third, big third party, bring consultants in, map all the processes, just start to get comfortable and probably start with something, um, Let's, let's say a more biteable chunk, if that makes sense in English, but um, not, not, uh, not, not started too complex because that's kind of like scaring a lot of people in the, in the organization. That's why a lot of organizations from, from my experience, then they never start the journey. It's like, oh, that's too big. That's too complicated. Let's not, not do that. We, we, can ne we could never afford it. And that's not the truth, realistically. Yeah, I love the iteration focused approach to this stuff. And I, I think for me personally, if I were gonna lead a project like this, I probably would start off with one of these really simple tools, whether that's Sapier or whether that's something that's built into something like MS Office, where even if it's not something that you need to do for your job, you just wanna understand how this stuff works, like make a spreadsheet and be like, hey, when there's a new row in the spreadsheet, send that person an email, <laughs> you right. know, and make, exactly. make that person your colleague. And it's like, oh, that's how that works. And then your brain starts to, figure out, well, you know, here's this process that like we actually should be automating. And then you do that. And then you're like, okay, there's a hundred different things. Now let's think about a holistic strategy to implement. And maybe we hire a consultant, you know, maybe we work with a, a third party that really gets this stuff even deeper than we do. But to your point, if you, if you think about it as this whole big project, you're probably not going to ever get started. Right. If you just bite a chunk off and, and do it on your own in an afternoon, and that's probably how long it would take to set up one of these things, then you're going to have a lot more confidence and a lot more knowledge to, to be successful with it. So exactly. That's, exactly. that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, when, when you think about getting internal stakeholder buy-in on this stuff, how do you think about the business case and what are the other sort of considerations when trying to get people that you need bought in, maybe that's InfoSec, maybe, you know, it's IT, maybe it's other sort of functional leaders in the organization. What, what's your advice there? And um, yeah, can you just talk about that a bit? Yeah, I think the, 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 the key thing is, I mean, you need to have a clear owner who really understands the, um, the overall impact that automation has, and that is able to explain the benefits to kind of like all the different functions you, you talked about. Because very, very often, a lot of the corporate functions, they, they never, might not have never heard about RPA. They might never have kind of like thought about automation kind of like opportunities. So um, either you have like a center of excellence that's focusing on automation or the business is driving it either, either way, but somebody needs to own it. And I think the core, the core experience that, that I have in this space is that, so when we think about business case, I, I honestly, I don't like the, the, the term business case because business case always implies that you make an investment as a result, you can reduce manual labor, which leads, leads you to kind of like eliminate, I don't know, kind of like five people. Um, and that's what kind of like the traditional kind of like shared service business model might look like. Hey, you move your contact center from the United States to India and cost of labor is lower, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, that's what it should not be about. If, if, that's, it's, if, if all you want to achieve is cost saving, then RPA is probably okay, but it's not going to live up to its full potential. So the case, the business case should be, how can I accelerate processes? We talked about talent acquisition and the need for rapid talent feedback at this point in time. So how can we be faster and at the same time, and as a result, then kind of like deliver better quality, process quality um, to, uh, to candidates? Um, second piece is, how can we eliminate mistakes. I mean, realistically, I mean, we all heard the story, kind of like somebody mistakenly sent an email to a department with the candidate in copy making some kind of like nasty comments about this or, or that. So that's all part of the overall quality aspect of, of automation and taking the human out of the, out of the equation. How can you make sure you increase a better process quality on top of the speed we just, uh, we just talk about? And then, and then cost obviously is kind of like one one aspect as as well, but it, we sh you shouldn't lead with with cost. How can we make sure we eliminate 
kind of like time consuming tasks that um, kind of like kind of like require human human intervention, and usually also kind of like draw the recruiters away from the stuff they they love. And that's interacting with with talent, interacting with with candidates, and I think that's just like the core three things you need to you need to think about as an organization. So it's not only about about the cost. I think that's like the more the, the core thing that I always always recommend. Think about the use case. Think about the benefits. But um, that's why I'm not using the the business case terminology so often because it always implies that <laughs> kind of like cost cutting approach that uh, we have too much of in corporate organizations. Honestly, from my point of view. Yeah, I think my the MBA side of my brain sort of takes over with this stuff, and it's always about either increasing revenue or decreasing mm -hmm. costs and it seems like there, there's probably a bit of both here. If you're on the staffing side, look, this is probably going to increase your revenue because right. you're going to build there a faster, higher quality product, which is going to expand your account revenue, increase your retention, increase your ability to win new business. On the TA side of things, you're decreasing time to fill, which has an ROI to the business, getting that engineer, salesperson, et cetera, in a seat faster. And it, it's also just better, you know, you're talking about all this, you know, removing errors and increasing efficiency stuff. The other funny sort of connection that we have is you interned uh, in York, Pennsylvania um, a million years ago, yeah. which was sort of this like, you know, factory town in the middle of Pennsylvania. And I'll actually be there uh, this weekend because oh, nice. my um, future in-laws live in York, Pennsylvania. And because it is a factory town, my future mother-in-law is a master black belt in Six Sigma. Mm -hmm. um, she's you know, one of the few people that's sort of licensed to do that sort of mm -hmm. high level work and works with factories all over the world for um, various companies. And that's all she does, right? She looks at actual physical factories and understands how do we cut costs? How do we decrease errors? How do we increase efficiency? And also teaches other people to, to, to think about that stuff. And I, I think that you can take the same mentality to your talent acquisition factory, whether you're on the corporate or staffing side. And this is not, again, taking out the human elements of things and thinking about people as machines, but it is taking away a lot of this process that takes away the human elements of interviews and getting to know a candidate and, and all these things that really help people and are the most enjoyable parts of both sides of the equation because you're taking off the stress and the time um, of all these other tasks that, again, a machine can now do, which is pretty cool. Exactly, 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 yeah. Can, can you walk us through, just at a high level, if you were gonna create, let's say, you know, you were talking to somebody and they're like, hey, I'm interested in RPA, what are the steps I need to do to get this thing up and running? And like, how much time is this, what should my timeline be? Is it six months, 12 months, 18 months? What's step one? Yeah. So, I mean, in, in reality, it all starts with a proper process mapping. And I think that's where the complexity for a lot of organization comes, comes in because everybody says, yeah, we have a, com we have a process to do things. We have a process to uh, initiate a background check. It's <laughs> just to stick with TA. But in reality, you have maybe 25 or 30 processes. Um, so basically 30 recruiters might, might have a different way of doing things. At the end of the day, there, you might receive a background check from a third party vendor, but the way to the background check might be, might be different. And that's what, like I always recommend, I mean, you need to have a good understanding of the overall, of the overall process. And you also need to deep dive into the actual kind of like work instructions. How do you do that? Because from an RPA perspective, you need to define the ideal process and that involves different process steps. So for example, which window do you open first? Um, which window do you open second? Do you kind of like copy paste from here to there? Or do you kind of like initiate a specific request on another system first? And that's basically where a lot of the business people that um, kind of like I'm working with, um, they're pretty surprised about the level of detail you need to invest in the beginning. That's usually kind of like an exercise that can take, I don't know, kind of like a couple of hours. If it's an easy process, it can kind of take kind of like, kind of like two, three, four, five days. It's a more complex process, but the, the RPA bot um, kind of like can't assume. So we basically need to ex ex exactly explain 
what the bot needs to do. And it's like kind of like these factory bots you've probably seen before um, that get programmed by moving their kind of like arm around. And it's pr pretty much the same thing in the, RP, in, the RPO, in the RPA world where you need to say, hey, bot, um, open this window, um, log in, then open the second window, um, log in there, then open attachment. So it's, it's really a lot of detail that you need to go through to teach the bot how to operate. And that's basically why a consistent process mapping kind of like is the baseline for everything you're doing from an automation um, perspective. And then I think the second piece is once you've kind of like identified the process, obviously kind of like somebody needs to make it happen. Um, this can be kind of like happening through a kind of like developer or consultant that you probably hired or with the easier and basic tools like Power Automate from Microsoft we talked about. Um, that can be anybody in the organization who has a good understanding of the tool, um, kind of like term a citizen developer. You don't need to have an external consultant actually kind of like doing it. Um, and then you just need to test it. You need to understand what's the process quality um, going to be like. If it's like a hundred or a thousand uh, kind of like times the process was run in a kind of like secure environment. Um, but you need to understand is the process robust enough and is the quality good enough so I can go live um, with it. So I, these are usually the steps after you go live. Obviously, somebody needs to be able to monitor, understand, are there any kind of hiccups? Um, is there kind of like a flaw in the process that allows um, or requires manual manual intervention? But again, the most important thing, and that's what um, kind of like I realized, is really the process mapping, sitting down with the business and jotting down what's the actual approach the uh, the users are taking today. That takes the most time, but it's important that that you kind of like invest that because that's the baseline of your automation success. That's just uh, the reality there. Got it. And it sounds like you're advocating for a strategy where you're not looking at your entire organization and saying, okay, there are 300 processes and let's map each of them and then let's implement each of them. You're, you're basically saying, look, let's start with one, you know, maybe you do a batch the next time you, you do five and, and you kind of work your way through this versus being paralyzed with a, a project that's going to take you two years or something like that. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, what, what, so the, the, the approach we're usually taking is we usually bring people from different parts of the business together that touch the individual process or the corporate function and start with some brainstorming and just say like, hey, let's just create a long list of things where you have manual, uh, manual work. And probably you identify 50 tasks that are done manual today that you think could be done um, kind of like automatically through automation. And then basically you think about it, okay, how much, how much time does the actual process take? Uh, let's say it's like one process step is a minute. And then how often do you do that per day, per week, per month, whatever it is. And then you automatically kind of like receive, you kind of like stack rank the opportunities because you have like a five minute process and you do that 10,000 times per year, then obviously that has a much big, bigger potential than the kind of like five times a year, one minute process that you're, that you're doing. So it's an easy way to collect the let's say, low hanging fruits and then work your way through additional opportunities over, over time. But a full Big Bang doesn't really work because in reality, you need to have somebody that can set up the bot, that kind of like can work with the business to, kind of like to, to eliminate the flaws. So you need to start with a limited number of opportunities instead of trying to solve everything at once. This won't, won't work realistically. Love it. Yeah. Again, back to that sort of iterative approach, you know, start yeah. small, learn, get better. What are some of the pitfalls you see people fall into when they start to do this stuff? Yeah, I think, I think the, core, the core thing is, is not really understanding what RPA can do, but especially what RPA can't do. Um, and just to give you kind of like one, one example, we, we just, I had a call actually yesterday, we we're just implementing a, an RPA bot, uh, kind of like in certain, in a certain part of our, of our business. And it's actually kind of like collecting candidate information and kind of copying and pasting it in different uh, different systems. So um, in Europe, for example, if you are kind of like applying for a job, it is um, kind of like legal that you're putting your salary expectation in the in the application. Um, and we take that and then basically put it in a kind of like third party technology. So the issue is that kind of like in the original design where we where we kind of like collect the information from the candidates, it's a free field. 
So basically, you can type in, I want 75,000 um, euros uh, with a euro sign behind the digits, or you can have the euro sign in front of the digit, or you have somebody, you can sign, you see euro and just write it out in capital letters. And the bot doesn't know. So that's basically the point where um, all of a sudden, because you couldn't predefine that kind of like this field is a kind of like value field with the euro field, the bot doesn't know what to do because it doesn't really understand and doesn't recognize the value. So that's just one, one example where a human has the cognitive ability to say, yeah, sure, that's, um, <laughs> that's like uh, 75,000. But um, kind of like if somebody kind of like writes 75,000 in words instead of digits, then the bot won't understand and recognize that. And I think that's just something where there is sometimes a lot of frustration um, from the business because they under sometimes believe that the RPA bot, it's just like another colleague, another human um, that's doing the job but faster and cheaper and in an automated in an automated way. And I think that's just like where, where expectation and reality <laughs> sometimes meet. Um, and that, that's just like one of the common pitfalls that um, there, there's too many expectations from the business um, because they don't really understand the limitations. So just like one, one example, real life example from, from yesterday, <laughs> I thought I'd share. I love it. And I think this is also, in my mind, at least a, a case for somebody to get their hands dirty with one of these really cheap or free to use right. tools and just use it yourself. And so you're like, oh, it, it can't do, it, it can't like parse this unstructured mm -hmm. data and figure out what the person who input it meant. Okay, that's, that's a really good thing to know. Mm -hmm. um, and, right. and doing one or two of these yourself, maybe it's for your personal life, maybe it's for your professional life, sort of gives you that context. Right. So that's amazing. Exactly. We've defined, you know, what is RPA? We've talked about use cases, implementation, all this stuff, vendors. Is there any other last tidbits that you'd like to share with somebody who is looking to implement this at their organization? Anything else that they should kind of know at the start of their journey? Yeah, I think the, the key thing is, and the, the, the advice is always do, don't wait. I mean, currently there's kind of like research out there that around, I think like 70, 65% of all TA processes across the world are not automated. Um, and I think that automation is going to be a big differentiator because it's not only about the cost savings. We, we talked about that. It's also about uh, providing better quality, better experience for, for, for talent through faster processes. So my, my recommendation is always don't wait. Start. Start small. Um, go to go to your Office 365 suite today. Just um, kind of like invest forty dollars into Microsoft Power Automate or Zapier, um, and just and just test it out to get the understanding because um, this will be a competitive differentiator for every talent acquisition organization in the future, and. If you're still relying on your clunky ATS and a subpar um, kind of like experience, you, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle once all that COVID craze is over and the economy kicks back in again. We're, we're going to really kind of like fight again for candidates. So my, my recommendation is start small, but start. Uh, just experiment. Just wait, fail fast, <laughs> as always. Learn um, and take it from there. But, but don't, don't wait. The time is now. I think that's just like my, my personal kind of like last... <laughs> Um, advice for anybody here listening to, to our conversation. I love it. I think it's great advice. And especially where there is a learning curve right now, you can be one of these best in class right. TA organizations who's actually leveraging this. You're going to be ahead of the curve and you're going to stay ahead of the curve as you continue to learn ways of right. implementing this technology into your stack. And, it, and to your point, you know, we all remember how insanely competitive the talent market was even a few months ago. Right. And there's a lot of reason to believe it's going to get back there. Mm. And even if it doesn't, this is just going to make your life better, your candidate's life better, your recruiter's life better. And it's going to have meaningful impact in your organization, which is always great, um, especially if you sort of evangelize that and, and use it to um, grow your own presence in the company. So, Absolutely. Tim, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge on this emerging yet super relevant and interesting topic. I really appreciate the time. No, thank you so much for, for having me, Phil. It was really a great, a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, and, and uh, thanks for being interested in my, my RPA story. So <laughs> really liked the conversation here. Pretty cool. Thanks. Awesome.